there. This is my den. This is where I spend most of my time every single day. Uh, it's my favorite room in our house. If the kitchen is the heart of a Victorian home, I would say that this is the brain of our home. It's also sort of a sacred space where I get to put my thoughts together every day. So I can show you a few things about how it works. So first, here's some of the, some of the lamps. And it's daylight right now, obviously. I don't really need this yet, but just to show you how these things work, I'm going to go ahead and light it. It's on a wall-mounted sconce. See how that swivels? And then if I don't want it there, this, this is actually a removable lamp. It just comes out and goes wherever you need it. But right now it's here. And so I'm going to light it using a little matchbook from my Chatelaine. So anyone who's never seen one before, this is a Chatelaine. These come up quite a bit in my stories because I think they're one of the coolest things ever. <laughs> it's basically a tool belt for a Victorian lady. And what I'm going to use right now is the, the match safe that's on here. There's little matches in here. Um, so the characters in my books have those. Because like I said, I think they're cool. Turn up the wick so that I can light it. And I'm going to turn it down again. If it's up too high, it can crack the glass. Also, especially if it's cold in the room. Also, if it's up too high, it's going to get smoke on the chimney. If you've ever seen someone with a lamp chimney that's really smoky, that's just incompetence on their part. And if you ever see it in a movie or a play where they're putting black paint on lamp chimneys to try to make it look more realistic, that's just an idiotic director who doesn't know how these things work. Because if you adjust the wick correctly, you're going to get a lot of light and no smoke. <laughs> and um, also, if it's turned up so high so that it is smoking, it's not giving as much light. So, little tips. That's a flat wick lamp. Over here I have one that's got a round wick. So I'm going to take off the shade first. Put that somewhere very safe. And then this, the chimney, I have learned a very expensive lesson. The chimney goes, when I'm doing this, Chimney goes in a place that's not in my direct line of knocking something onto the floor. That's very important. So, I'm going to turn up the wick. And I'm going to light it. It's summer and the... Just because of the weather the matches in my vest, it got a little damp because of where I was storing it. Because I don't use it as much in the summer as in the winter. Because I've also got these boxes with matches everywhere. So, if anyone's wondering why the matches aren't lighting super quick, that's why. It just got a little damp. So I'm turning that up just a little bit so it gets nice and bright. And very carefully put the lampshade back on to protect our eyes because it's a very bright light and staring straight into a very bright light is not good for the vision. So I'm just going to make sure that this is at a good level. High enough to get good light, not so high that things get smoky. There's one more fire-operated apparatus in this room and that is my heater. This is a perfection heater. These were very, very popular in the late 19th and especially the early 20th centuries. They sold these off the back of oil trucks. People had trucks that would come around and sell oil. 
the same way they sold ice and other commodities. And it was very clever that they would also sell these little heaters because that way uh, people would buy more kerosene. <laughs> Plus it's easier than firing up a whole fireplace. There's that. And once it gets going, I put it down. And I put the top over it. And that gets the room very warm very quickly. It's already fairly warm in this room today, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn it off as soon as I've lit it. <laughs> because I don't need it today. But I wanted to show it to you. And I put that off to the side where no one's going to knock it over. It lives in a corner when it's not in use for that exact reason. And the rest of my den. So one of the most important things to a writer are books. All the best books in our house live in this room. Uh, partly because this room has the best bookshelves in the house. Partly because uh, they're the books I use the most for my research. And those two things are not a coincidence. <laughs> so it's very intentional. And there are a lot of antique books. I don't have to give you book by book tour, I don't think. Over here, we have my desk. This originally belonged to Gabriel's grandmother. I just love it. And it's got a lot of character. It's an old desk, family heirloom. I draft all my manuscripts by hand before I type them up. So I've got all my, my notebooks and my books. Here I've got a whole basket full of different notebooks for different stories that I've written. Um, they're all just black. They start out as blank books and I was having trouble keeping, keeping track of them. So then I started putting pictures of various characters on the front so that I can grab the right one when I bend down to grab one because as I'm reading various books from all the bookshelves you saw, I will often come across something that I say to myself, oh, that would be really good in story, maybe it's story seven and I'm currently working on story five. <laughs> and so then I'll write down a note about it for the notebook for story seven and I just come back to it later. Right now, the book I'm working on, the two main love interest characters in it are based on these two photos right here that I've got up on my desk. So you get to find out who they are when, when we get there. I've got other photos for my other characters up here on top of the bookshelves. So some of my favorites, these are Jacob and Addie and Ken and Felix, of course. Um, there's more about those on our website and my books. My inkwell. Gabriel just gave this to my husband, Gabriel, just gave this to me for our anniversary. We just had our 15th anniversary, which is the crystal anniversary, and so this is a really pretty crystal inkwell, which I just absolutely love. So I'll give you a quick view of it. It's just very, very pretty. I'll try not to spill the ink. <laughs> and the pen, this is called either a dip pen or or a steel nibbed pen. Just goes dip in there. I also have a fountain pen, which is this one. Um, can't see it very well, but that one, I bought that one with the advance for the very first book I ever sold. So that was really exciting. These were developed in the late 19th century. It took people, people were messing around with them for a really long time. Um, Thomas Jefferson had one he made for himself as an early experimentation, but really getting the design down really well where it could be marketable was uh, pretty much a late 19th century thing. And then the other gift that my husband gave me for our anniversary was a mechanical pencil. 
which is really fun because sometimes I'll often be writing in my rocking chair, which I'll show you in a minute, or somewhere else in the house, and I don't want to get ink on my dress. <laughs> and then I use a pencil, and I'm still looking for the right lead for this one before I can use it. It's going to be tricky finding the right size, but we'll manage it eventually. It's all just a question of time. When I'm writing with real ink, this is a rocker blotter, so this goes over the, the page to dry the ink quickly. This little pad of paper is also called a blotter, and that is for uh, wiping off the pen. When it's first dipped, it's got a lot of ink on it, so you have to wipe it. So it can get a little confusing because this is a blotter, and this is a blotter too. <laughs> so I usually refer to this one as a rocker blotter, just to differentiate. This one, it's rather remarkable. It has a thimbleberry on top. I've never seen that in artwork in anything but this. Thimbleberries are a wonderful type of berry in this region. And it's kind of fun to find one in artwork. And then, last thing in here. Oh, actually one more thing before we get to the rocking chair. I wanted to show you this bookshelf because any fans of my series, this is the bookshelf that inspired the one Jacob has in, this, in the series. The, the style of bookcase that has a desk that can be closed and locked, and it also has a glass-fronted case. So those of you who've read, who've read book two and remember the bit about the how his diaries are in there and McCoy tells him he should take his uncle's advice and start locking it, that's the style of desk. Okay, last couple of items. Over here, we have my rocking chair which I absolutely adore because it's mounted on springs. And so it's very, very comfy. And then we have a very fun little Victorian invention. This is called a parlor pig because of the shape. It also kind of looks like a rolling pin with feet, just a little bit. This is a footrest, which is oodles of fun. Oops. And so it just goes like that, <laughs> little parlor pig. And so I sit here and I'm going to grab my book. And since I won't be at my desk, I'm going to grab a pencil. And I will leave you guys to whatever you're doing. And I am just going to sit here and write. Bye bye.